So in the previous uh, lecture, we were talking about weak duality theorem uh, before we stopped. So in weak duality theorem, we just take the, inf so for, for the primal problem, we define a dual problem in the following way. We take the infimum of the, <clears throat> of the Lagrangian with respect to X and we name it a function Q mu. And then uh, we define the dual problem, which is to maximize Q of mu uh, for all mu greater than or equal to zero. So mu is element wise non-negative. Um, and this gives me Q star and the weak duality theorem says that Q star is less than or equal to F star, which means that the optimal dual value is less than or equal to the optimal primal value. And it gives you a good way to know a lower bound on the optimal value of the primal problem. Uh, we had covered the proof of weak duality theorem. So one of the two things that we left uh, that was left uh, unproven in the previous class was the fact that Q is concave function and D which is defined as the domain of Q where Q mu is finite. So Q mu is greater than minus infinity. Can uh, can you turn off the mic, please? Okay. Uh, sorry for the interruption. Uh, so everyone can hear me fine, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. So the two things we are going to prove first is Q is concave. Q as a the dual function is concave and the domain of the dual function is actually a convex set. So no matter what, no matter what the structure of the primal problem is, it turns out that the dual problem is always a convex problem. Okay. So this is always a convex problem, even though the primal problem itself may or may not be convex. So let's look at the first statement, which is, So let me call it lemma one, which is Q. Q is convex. Let's try to prove this result. So I have L of X. So I want to prove that Q is convex or concave. Oh, of course, concave. Yes, that's right. Okay, so, so let me write Q of mu is equal to inf of Lx mu, mu is greater than or equal to zero. And I want to prove that Q is convex, concave, which means I need to prove that Q of alpha mu one plus one minus alpha mu two is greater than or equal to alpha Q mu one plus one minus alpha Q mu two. So this is what I need to prove. Let's see how to prove it. So let me compute the Lagrangian uh, with respect, uh, the Lagrangian evaluated at X and the convex combination of mu one and mu two. This is the same as the convex combination of the Lagrangian itself. And that's because Lagrangian is, is an affine function or a linear function of, actually affine function of mu. Okay, so all of you agree with this equality. So, the Lagrangian of convex combination is the same as convex combination of Lagrangian because Lagrangian is a 
a fine function of mu. Okay, now I can take the infimum on both the sides of the Lagrangian equals to infimum over x. This x is in capital X of the alpha Lx mu one plus one minus alpha L x mu two. What is this equal to? This is Q of alpha mu one plus one minus alpha mu two. Okay, so I take the infimum with respect to x on both the sides. On the left side, I recover Q of alpha mu one plus one minus alpha mu two, which is a good thing because that's the expression on this side. But what do we have on the right side of this Lagrangian equation? Well, I have infimum of sum of two functions. But you know, here on this side of the Q equation, we don't really have, we have individual infimum, we don't have infimum over the entire expression. So how do we get from this expression to that expression? How do we go from this expression to this particular expression? What can I use here? You just find the uh, infinum of the individual terms for the sum. Right. So what happens when I take the infimum of the individual sum? So I have infimum over f1 of x plus f2 of x, let's say. What happens when I take individual infimum? So there is some sign and then I have infimum over F1 of X plus infimum over F2 of X. What's the sign here? Should it be less than equal to, greater than equal to, equal to? Any thoughts? Less than or equal to? Well, it's it's actually greater than or equal to. Let's see why why this should be the why this should be true. Okay. So assume that minimum exists. Okay. So let's not worry about the infimum. You can extend the argument for minimum to the infimum case with using epsilons and deltas in an appropriate fashion. Okay, so, so let's say the minimum exists and I'm going to call x zero star equals to the argument of F1 plus F2, x one star equals to argument of F1 and x two star equals to argument of F2. Okay. So I have F1 of X0 star plus F2 of X0 star is greater than equal to, well, okay. F1 of X0 star is greater than equal to F1 of X1 star. Similarly, F2 of X0 star is greater than or equal to F2 of X2 star. That's just the property of minimum, right? So the sum must be greater than or equal to F1 of X1 star plus 
f2 of x2 star. Okay, that is essentially the argument, the crux of the argument for the infimum as well. Okay, I'll let you parse through this argument and let me know if you have any questions. So infimum of sum is greater than or equal to the sum of infimum. Okay, any questions so far on this small excursion? Okay, now we can just apply this particular result about the infimum, which is purely a property of infimum we can apply it in this expression and we recover that the Q of alpha mu one plus one minus alpha mu two is greater than equal to. So this greater than equal to here is exactly the same as this greater than equal to here. So that's coming from this, this inequality sign is coming from here and it's greater than or equal to alpha q mu one plus one minus alpha q mu two. Fairly straightforward. Okay, so this would imply that q is a concave function. Okay. The second lemma was D equals to mu such that Q mu is greater than minus infinity is convex. This is also easy to prove. So let's say mu one, I pick mu one, mu two from D, the set D, and I pick alpha between zero and one. Then Q of alpha mu one plus one minus alpha mu two is greater than or equal to alpha Q of mu one plus one minus alpha Q of mu two, which is greater than minus infinity. Okay, so I know that since mu one and mu two lies in D, I know that Q of mu one and Q of mu two are both strictly greater than minus infinity. And so this side, I'm summing up something that is strictly greater than minus infinity and uh, some other number which is strictly greater than minus infinity. So the sum is also going to be strictly greater than minus infinity. So this implies that alpha mu one plus one minus alpha mu two, that also lies in D. So that establishes the statement that D is a convex set.
Okay, so through straightforward arguments, what we have found is for given a, given a primal problem, we have a corresponding dual problem and the dual problem is always convex. And the optimal value of the dual problem is strictly less than equal. Well, it's not strictly, but it is less than equal to the optimal value of the primal problem. Now, what happens when you have a solution to the dual problem? Let's, let's think about that. Well, I haven't really talked about the geometric meaning of the weak duality theorem. So let me first show you what it means to have, no, let me actually talk about duality gap first. So this is just the way you define it. So if Q star is strictly less than F star, then we say that there is a duality gap. If Q star is equal to F star, then we say that there is no duality gap. Okay, this is just the terminology. So in the context of optimization, if someone says there is a duality gap, it means that the optimal dual value is strictly less than the optimal primal value. If the two values are equal, two optimal values are equal, then we say that there is no duality gap. Okay, now let's go back to the picture of the set S and the hyperplanes that contain set S in the positive half space. So here is my GX, let me put RR. This is my R and I have to draw a set. This is the set S, which is okay. So if you recall, what we what we did in the previous class was we drew a hyperplane, which was barely touching the set S. The vertical to the hyperplane was mu one. And this y intercept was equal to the infimum of the Lagrangian at mu. Okay, it was important in order for this to be infimum, it's important that this hyperplane barely touches the set S and the set S should be in the positive half space of this particular hyperplane. Okay, hopefully all of you remember this figure. Now, what I'm going to do is, I have drawn one specific hyperplane here. Now let me draw different hyperplanes with different mu satisfying the same criteria. So I can draw, I can draw something like this. So this is say, let me use mu one. This is mu two one. Again, mu two is non-negative. And this y-intercept is the infimum of Lagrangian at mu two. Now I'm going to draw the third intercept. Okay. 
and this intercept is Okay, so I have, drawn... I have a question here. Yeah, sure. Uh, are you keeping uh, x to be constant when you're uh, when you're when you're saying that you're drawing these hyperplanes? Your x is remaining to be constant. It's and f of x, g of x are all evaluated at x itself. So, so x is not constant. Uh... Uh, me meaning like. Um, you're you're treat, you're evaluating for the same same value of x. No, no. So so remember that the infimum. So let's consider each of these hyperplanes. So the infimum. Let's say at x one, the you you have the infimum of the Lagrangian. That x one corresponds to this point, which is g x one and f x one. Okay. Similarly. If x2 is what gets infimum in this situation, when you are taking the infimum of Lagrangian with respect to mu2, that would be this point, which is gx2 and fx2. Okay, wherever it's touching, wherever this hyperplane is touching the set S. Yeah. So the, the corresponding x would, the infimum will be at the point uh, achieved at the point which is where the hyperplane is touching the set S. Yeah, makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So now I have drawn a bunch of hyperplanes and I see that for every hyperplane, I have a specific Y intercept and that Y intercept represents the infimum of the Lagrangian uh, uh, corresponding to the norm normal of that particular hyperplane. And as I change the hyperplane, of course, the y-intercept changes, but, and I can only vary mu such that mu is non-negative. So I can have a, a flat mu, I can have a curved, I mean, a slanting mu, but I can't have a vertical mu. So this sort of, I can't have a, you know, I can't, can't have a vertical line. Well, this doesn't look good. Okay, well, anyways, it can't be a vertical line. It has to be a slanting line or it can be a flat line. And so, of course, the best, uh, uh, in this situation, the highest infimum occurs, the highest value of this infimum occurs when this is the red line at mu three. And so this is where the optimal dual, so the optimal dual solution is going to be mu three because that's where the maximum, uh, That is where the maximum y-intercept happens in this figure. Okay. Now I'm going to draw a bunch of uh, such diagrams, and I'll show you for different shapes of the state S, you will have different uh, a different uh, shape of the hyperplane such that uh, the y-intercept is equal. It corresponds to the optimal dual variable. Now the next set S that I'm going to draw looks like this. This is my set S. And in this case, the best hyperplane that I can draw would be as follows. Well, it touches it here. This is mu star one. Okay, so the hyperplane barely touches the set S and the Y intercept is basically equal to, of course, Q mu star. So that would be the corresponding uh, optimal dual solution. Uh, let me draw another set, which I'll try to draw right next to it. So you have both the figures. This is what my F star would be. 
Now let's look at the hyperplane. Well, this is the let me call it mu star. Uh, well, it's not really a geometric. So there is no geometric multiplier here. Let me call it mu tilde. Okay, so this is the best hyperplane you can draw such that the set S is on the half space, positive half space. And this particular hyperplane is barely touching the set S. Okay, and this is a situation, this situation illustrates so let me go back to the first two figures I had drawn. So in this figure, there was no duality gap because this was your F star. This point was your F star and uh, the Q star was exactly equal to F star. In this case as well, the F star was right here. And that was equal to Q of mu star. Whereas in this case, F star is right here. So that would be your F star intercept. But the optimal dual variable is basically, or the optimal dual value is actually Q of mu tilde. And this is, this is the duality gap. Okay, because the optimal primal val value is not the same as it's higher than the optimal dual value. And this figure also explains why F star is always greater than or equal to Q star because F star cannot be less than Q star, no matter how the set S turns out to be. Okay. In your free time, you can draw different, different shapes and uh, properties of uh, different, different shapes of the set S and you will find that you will always have F star above Q star. And um, in some cases, you will have duality gap. In some cases, you will not have any duality gap. Okay, and it all depends. The, the fact that you have duality gap or not purely depends on the geometry of the set S itself. Okay, so I drew three set S here. Okay, and in two cases, there was no duality gap because F star and Q star coincided. Whereas in this case, in the third figure, there is a duality gap because Q star is strictly below F star. Okay, any question? Okay, so let's consider the case of no duality gap. So that's this figure and this figure. There are no duality, there is no duality gap in both the cases. So what can you say about the uh, optimal dual variable and the geometric multiplier for the problem? What is the relationship between the optimal dual variable and the geometric multiplier? Okay, so let me write down a theorem. So no duality gap implies set of optimal dual solution is equal to the set of geometric multipliers. Okay, so your set of geometric multipliers coincide with the set of optimal dual solution 
to the dual problem. But that's only when you have no duality gap. If there is a duality gap, which means that Q star is strictly less than F star, then this implies there are no geometric multipliers. Okay, so in those situations, you cannot find geometric multipliers for that problem. Okay, so let's go back to these figures. Because there is no duality gap here, F star is equal to Q mu star. Mu star becomes the geometric multiplier for the original problem. Same thing here, mu three becomes the geometric multiplier for the original problem. Whereas in this case, uh, because it has a duality gap, there are no geometric multipliers for this problem. So you can't have a geometric multiplier here. Okay, and now this theorem leads us to what is famously called the saddle point theorem. Which says that X star mu star optimal solution slash geometric multiplier if and only if x star mu star is a saddle point of Lagrangian, which means L of x star mu less than equal to L of x star mu star is less than equal to L of x mu star. So assuming you have no duality gap and assuming your dual problem has an optimal solution, that optimal solution is exactly equal to the geometric multiplier. And because it's a geometric multiplier, you can, um, uh, you can, so, so that particular point and the optimal solution forms a saddle point for the Lagrangian. So along the X axis, if you fix mu star along the X axis, the Lagrangian is minimized at X star. And if you fix X star, then along the Y, along the mu axis, the Lagrangian is maximized at mu star. Okay. So that's the meaning of saddle point. The Lagrangian would look like Okay, so this is what the shape of Lagrangian L is going to look like. So along this axis, along this axis, the Lagrangian is minimized. Whereas along this axis, the Lagrangian is maximized. This is my X star comma mu star pair.
Okay. So, so far we have talked extensively about the inequality constraint problem, but you can extend the entire argument to problems where you have equality as well as inequality constraint by just considering lambda as one of the other parameter in the definition of Lagrangian. So if you have any questions so far, uh, please feel free to ask me now. And then we'll proceed to discussion about extending this to equality constraint problems. Okay, so let's proceed to the equality constraint case. So I want to minimize function fx such that h of x equal to zero g of x less than equal to zero and x belongs to a set capital X. I can define the Lagrangian for this case as a function of three variables x lambda and mu And as usual, I will define Q as a function of lambda and mu, which is the infimum over X for the Lagrangian. Okay, so we have the primal problem. I computed the Lagrangian. I did the infimum of the Lagrangian. I got the function Q. And then the dual problem would be given by, I want to maximize Q of lambda mu, mu greater than or equal to zero. And lambda is an RM. So lambda is unconstrained. Lambda could be uh, positive or negative, but mu has to be non-negative. Okay. So by now, what we have learned is for every primal problem, we can come up with a dual problem. The optimal solution or optimal value of the dual problem is less than equal to the optimal value of the primal problem. Let me just write it. So this would be my Q star. This would be my F star. So we have learned about a few things. The first thing is Q star less than equal to F star. The second thing that we have learned is mu star. So if Q star is equal to F star, so there is no duality gap, then mu star is a geometric multiplier. Okay. 
Okay, so mu star is the optimal solution to the dual problem, and that is also the geometric multiplier for the original problem. Um, of course, I, I should actually say mu star comma lambda star now that we have two Lagrange, no, sorry, two geometric variables, lambda star and mu star. So those will be the geometric multiplier for the original problem. And we have learned Prof. about the, yeah. Prof. Uh, does the second point goes, does it go the other way around? When you say this is geometric multiplier, then can we say uh, Q star will be, there'll be no duality gap as well. Oh, that's a good point. No, actually, uh, No, so there is uh, nothing in the book written about the converse part. Let me think about it. So your question is, if I have geometric multipliers, does that mean, oh, actually that's the definition of geometric multiplier, okay. Uh, all right, so what's the definition of geometric multiplier? Geomet mu star is geometric multiplier if F star is equal to inf over X, L of X comma mu star, right? That's the definition of geometric multiplier. And this is exactly equal to Q star. What was your question again? Wasn't this wasn't this your question or was your question slightly different? Uh, my question was uh, if if you have my my, I, my question was that uh, if you if you know that mu star or lambda star is the geometric multiplier, can we say no duality gap exists for sure? Like right, so you, uh, right. you started with q star equal to f star. So I'm saying the other way around. Right, so if I, let's say mu star is my geometric multiplier, then I know that F star is equal to the infimum of the Lagrangian at mu star. Yeah, yeah, kind of makes sense. That is yes. exactly equal to Q of mu star. This is exactly equal to Q of mu star. Now, is it the maximum? Is it the maximum of all possible Q of mu? Let me think about it. I'm inclined to say that yes, that is the case by definition, but I'm not 100% confident that what I'm saying is mathematically correct. The reason is I don't have a proof on top of my mind that Q mu star is the maximum value. It's the optimal dual solution. Let me get back to you in the next class on this part. I'll have to look at some of the examples that are there in the book to see or come up with a situation where there is a geometric multiplier, but it's not the optimal dual solution. I think that's what the question, I mean, the, the answer would hinge upon that particular assertion that if you have a geometric multiplier, then, and then you have no duality gap and the, it is the optimal solution to the dual problem. So, it may require some amount of thinking, which I'll do later on. Yeah. Okay, thanks for this question. Okay, so there are three things we learned. The first one was the weak duality theorem. The second one was that if you have no duality gap, then the optimal dual solution is the geometric multiplier. And the third one was the saddle point theorem, which basically says that the optimal solution geometric multiplier pair is a saddle point for the original problem.
sorry is the saddle point for the lagrangian okay now what i want to do is uh, try to derive the dual formulation for some simple linear programming problem just to illustrate how you can compute the dual problem by hand for some of the simple situations so let's say my primal problem is i want to minimize c transpose x such that ax is equal to b x is greater than equal to 0 this is said to be a standard linear programming problem and we would like to compute the dual solution to this problem okay let me define capital set x to be x greater than equal to 0 okay so now my problem is i want to minimize c transpose x such that ax equal to b x in capital x okay so what's the lagrangian lx comma lambda that c transpose x plus Should I use b minus ax equal to 0 or ax minus b equal to 0? What should I do? Let's, let's go with b minus ax equal to 0. Yeah, I think this is fine. Let me use B minus AX equal to zero. So this is my Lagrangian. Now I need to find Q of Lambda, which is infimum of X in capital X of L of X comma Lambda. Okay. What is the infimum of the Lagrangian with respect to X? Remember X is greater than or equal to zero. What would the infimum be? Well, the first term doesn't depend on X. So I can kind of ignore, well, I don't really need to ignore it because it will be part of infimum. But this is this, this term doesn't depend on x. Okay, only this term depends on x. And I have two situations. Uh, sorry, I have, uh, I always have x greater than or equal to zero. So what would the infimum be like? So let me split this into two situations where C minus A transpose lambda is greater than or equal to zero and C minus A transpose lambda is not greater than or equal to zero. So at least one of the elements is less than zero, strictly less than zero. What's the answer for the first case? So I'm minimizing over X greater than or equal to zero. And I'm looking at the case C minus A transpose Lambda is greater than or equal to zero.
Okay. So let's think about it. For this case, C minus A transpose lambda greater than or equal to zero. If I want to minimize C minus A transpose lambda transpose X subject to X greater than or equal to zero, then it will be minimized when X is equal to zero because if X had a positive element, then the entire value of this term will be positive. So therefore this is minimized when X is equal to zero, which means that the optimal value is going to be lambda transpose B. Whereas if any of the element is strictly less than zero, I can take the corresponding X to be minus infinity and I can get minus infinity as the infimum over infimum of the Lagrangian. Okay. For these two cases. Then I have to say D, which is lambda in RM such that Q of lambda is greater than minus infinity, which is C minus A transpose lambda is greater than equal to zero. That's my domain of the Lagrange multiplier or domain of the dual problem. So now I have everything with me. I have the expression for Q lambda and I have the domain of Q where Q is finite and I can form the dual problem, which is Where should I write it? Let me write it here. So the dual problem would be, I want to ma maximize lambda transpose or maybe B transpose lambda, lambda in RM such that A transpose lambda is less than equal to C. Okay, this is my dual problem for the original optimization problem. There was a question. No, okay. So this is typically the step you would take for computing the dual problem. So the first simple thing is to set up the primal problem, identify what the set capital X is. Once you have identified that, then you construct the Lagrangian and you figure out under what conditions the minimum of the Lagrangian is going to be finite. So you split the cases accordingly and you identify what the value of Q lambda is going to be by taking the minimum of the Lagrangian. And then you look at the domain of the uh, dual function where the, the Q of lambda is greater than minus infinity. That gives you the region of the dual space that you would like to concentrate on for doing the dual optimization. And then you basically set up maximization of Q lambda subject to lambda being in D, capital D, the domain of Q. And that gives you the dual, uh, dual problem for the original primal problem. The, in, the cool thing to note here is that in the primal problem, you have the equality constraint, whereas in the dual problem, you get, the, get an inequality constraint. Okay, so it just equality constraint turns into an inequality constraint in the dual problem. That's something you see in many instances. Okay. So any question on duality gap or dual problem? Okay, great. So 
uh, in the next class we'll talk about under what conditions so what are the conditions under which there is no duality gap we'll probably look at a, one more problem of uh, computing the dual problem and after that we'll talk about dynamic optimization problem all right see you guys on wednesday oh professor yes uh can you possibly show an example where both lambda and mu will be involved and then how we will go about splitting the cases for q and also defining d yeah sure i think you can do that uh, let me uh, let me take questions from other people if there are any if not then i'll stop the recording and then we can have a discussion on the example you have are there any other questions from the class okay so i'm going to stop the recording